Hi mushers! Well, I know you're probably feeling pretty broke right now since you bought all of the gear for your dog and probably a bike, pedals, but we can't totally neglect ourselves. So we need a helmet for sure. And there's a handful of other things that can be mountain bike specific or repurposed and shared with other outdoor activities that you already do. So let's talk about some of those things and how to prioritize them in the budget. All right, let's get right down to the bottom line for many of us that are just trying to jump into a rather expensive sport. How much do you really need to spend on a helmet for bike tour? And I would say that the answer is, how much do the helmets cost that fit you well and are comfortable enough, both temperature-wise and fit, that you won't have any excuse not to wear it? If you have any type of bike helmet that fits your head well, hasn't been in a wreck or stored where it's going to cook in the summer and freeze in the winter, and it's not from a decade ago, you're probably set to get started. But what if you don't have a helmet yet or you're thinking of getting something nicer or better suited to bike chairs specifically? What might you want to look for there? Well, what I really like is helmets that are meant for all mountain riding or trail riding because they have a lot of nice features like extra coverage around the ears and the base of the skull and I like to have a visor too for the shade and the good news here is that if you're on a really tight budget at least here in the US even the big box store helmets will have to pass the same baseline safety standards as the higher end helmets so you really can get something that will be baseline protective, even if it is a bit heavier, not as nice a padding or ventilation, it can still do the job. The only helmet to date that I've ever ended up flipped over and landing on my head on some rocks on and walking away with was actually a $14 Target mountain bike helmet. And I was all right. I checked myself out really closely and made sure that I you know, didn't have a concussion and I checked my equipment and my dog and then I rode off to buy a new helmet, one, and to keep on mushing. So the bottom line really is just don't skip a helmet. That was a, quite a few years ago though, so now there's newer technology for rotational impacts, things like MIPS, and so I make sure I include that because even some of the more bargain price, one size fits most helmets now, will offer a MIPS liner, so that's definitely something to look for. For those that are anticipating having snow or maybe fat biking all through the winter, you want to look into helmets that have a specific winter liner that they've been tested with and that you can purchase specifically for them. Because other than maybe a really thin liner like this under a regular helmet, you're not going to get a good protective fit. So you'll want something that, again, you're not going to make excuses for why you can't wear it. For the rest of your body, I really recommend knee pads. I can be a little cheap sometimes, and so I just got away with being lucky for years with my scooter because it's easier to bail off of that. But once I invested in knee pads, I've used them for every dog-powered rides since then, and solo mountain bike rides as well. Your knee's not going to politely refrain from getting bloodied up somehow just because a trail you're on happens to be easy. So that's why I just go with an every ride policy. And also because of that, I really prefer these reactive type material pads. They're very flexible normally, and then on a sudden hard impact, they harden up and they really have saved my bacon on at least two occasions. So just find a brand that fits you. Many of them have some sort of material like this that's you know proprietary to their brand or whatever. So check those out. And also, if you would feel more comfortable and confident wearing more body armor, like elbow pads as well, or getting a mountain bike helmet that also has a chin bar called a full face helmet, do that because people can judge you, but they can't take your wrecks for you. So do what makes you comfortable. Now we're talking gloves and gloves are not just a comfort 
temperature kind of issue. They're also a safety issue because your job number one as a musher is to not hit your dog with your bike or scooter or whatever they're pulling. So you need to be able to keep your index fingers firmly on the controls to keep the brakes covered at all times. So regardless of the weather, I always wear a pair of warm weather, full finger mountain biking gloves. They work great. They're often not that expensive. I wish I had just done that sooner instead of using some baseball gloves that I got at Target. So just invest in some mountain biking gloves. They're great. And once it gets too cold for that alone by itself, sticky fingers on metal brake levers is my next go-to. So what those are, I'll pop a photo in for you. They're silicone and they just keep that metal lever from sucking the heat out of your finger because it is not just being on the leading edge away from the other fingers and the wind chill on them out there that does it. Those silicone covers really do help. So you can check those out. My next line of defense is something like a really thin wool liner glove underneath a regular riding glove that's roughly two sizes larger so that you still have all the movement and circulation that you need and aren't actually making yourself colder. And also cross-country ski gloves can often be a good option that will still let you have grip where you need it and still have dexterity because you need precision braking. And then of course good old hand warmers. I put them in the top right here on on the veins so that it's keeping me warmer. Now for those of you in much colder climates though that have colder weather more often than I do, you may also want to invest in bar cover mitts. They go around your grip and your brake levers so that underneath you can still wear whatever thinner gloves that have fingers that are appropriate for the weather and put hand warmers in there too if you are in a really cold climate and it lets you have that option of a mitten type all over comfort keeping your fingers together feel without trapping all of your fingers in a mitten because jumping straight to using mittens if you're on public trails or there's rocks and ice that can be involved as well is an additional risk because if you're gripping the bars, you don't have your brakes covered. And if you're using your brakes with mittens on, then you don't have any fingers on your bars helping you stay in control. So just make sure that you get your uh, plan for cold weather hand gear situated before you're cresting the top of a big hill and realizing you have ice blocks for fingers and can't break on the way down. So I've talked a bit about shoes before and I still say that pinned pedals, metal pins, are going to be your first purchase if you're on a budget. But reasons to invest in mountain bike specific flat pedal shoes would be that the sole is grippier and longer lasting than just making do with your tennis shoes or a skateboard style shoe. And also these toes are quite reinforced and you can see I really needed the toe protection on this foot. That's my trailing foot and it really is a nice feature to have. So when you can, invest in the specific shoes and you'll really like the additional grip and security that they give you as well as giving you that easy off from flat pedals. And additionally, if you have a dog that's willing and able to go faster or your trails are rougher, or you don't have front suspension on your bike, better grip with your shoes is just gonna work that much better with your pedals to keep you securely on when you want to be. For the socks in your shoes, I don't actually recommend you layering when the weather gets to be colder or damp. I like to go with wool socks and that way you're not trying to cram too much into your shoes so that it's compressing things and you're actually losing circulation and making yourself colder in the long run. And again, if you're in a much colder, more often climate than I am, 
you might want to look into specific winter riding shoes or overboots that go over your shoes to help keep you a bit warmer. And even if the weather doesn't quite call for full length pants yet, I still wear a bit longer socks when I go riding because I just end up with less scrapes and scratches from brambles or grasses and just dry skin from brushing past the brush on the trails. And if you like loud colors, Funky socks are a great way to accessorize. At least clear lenses of some type are a good idea on the trail, just to keep something between your eyes and trail debris. Um, if you're also wanting shades, sunglasses as well, and you're like me and you took a look at the price tags for the kind that are meant for trails and went, oh, I'm just gonna try my driving glasses. Well, I can tell you, I've been there, I've done that, thankfully with cane across and not faster scootering or bikering. And not having that specific contrast set up of good lenses, it leaves you trying to jump over shadows or smacking into roots and ruts that you thought were shadows. So if you want sunglasses, you really do need to invest a little bit more so that they're the proper tint for trails or for snow glare, if that's gonna be an issue for you a lot on your rides. And something that applies to us mushers that are always seeking out the colder weather is anti-fog. These, I'm blown away by how well they handle not fogging, and I don't have to apply anything to them like I would for my regular glasses or for cheaper safety glasses. So that's a nice extra touch if you're already investing. If you're already an outdoor active type person coming into mushing, you're probably thinking, I don't need or want specific mountain biking clothes right now. And you're right. And actually, I love seeing people on the trail that are wearing yoga capris or running gear or even, you know, like road biking style kit. Because to me, that means there's somebody new that's come to the dirt side. Welcome, you know? And if someone's gonna judge you for that, don't even worry about it. They already think we're nuttier than a squirrel turd being attached to a dog. So let it slide. Just make sure that you're comfortable and that you're managing moisture, especially when it's below freezing out so that you can stay safe. And of course that universal caution of not having loose pant legs that are gonna get stuck in your chain ring. For outerwear and hydration and gear storage, I actually still multitask for the bike because I can justify having a lot more size capacity and jacket weights and vests for the weather if I'm sharing them between both running and hiking and biking and scooter as well. Reasons for eventually investing in mountain bike specific jerseys and pants eventually is that especially with all mountain and trail oriented clothing lines, they'll give you a lot more abrasion protection in the case of crashes or even just brushing past trail side debris. And that allows you room for the pads that I mentioned to fit underneath. And you'll just, you'll ruin much less clothing and lose less skin if you've got that type of gear on. So for pants in particular, I recommend investing sooner than later. I think it took me maybe three rides on my new at the time bike to end up ripping a hole in the knee of my Capri pants. So I knew that wasn't gonna save me any money long-term trying to repurpose those from running. And on the subject of holes and losing skin, Another benefit to gloves is that it protects the outside of your hand from brushing against brush. And of course, in a crash, it will keep you from losing the skin off your palms because you will not be mushing for a while if you do that. And last but not least, especially if it is bothering you personally, is saddle comfort. It can take a while to build up tolerance to be sitting on the seat for any length of time. But also your first line of defense there is free and that is practicing what I've talked about, standing with level pedals and actually having your seat down so that you're not sitting on it and you're learning to maneuver without it. Other free things you can try 
include tilting the nose of the saddle, so slightly nose down or nose up instead of perfectly level, or sliding the saddle forward or backward on the rail. Beyond that, if riding more regularly isn't helping you get used to your saddle, toughing it out is probably not the way to go. So if you're going to look for a good saddle, that doesn't mean a big, giant, puffy, gel-cushioned one. They're actually sold by width based on how far apart your sit bones are so that the saddle fits you to be more comfortable for pedaling and sitting on it. And they'll also have some things like varying cutouts, different length of the nose, and overall length of the saddle. And I ended up finding the perfect saddle for me, and that was all I needed. But if you're still not comfortable, and it should be comfortable once you're riding regularly, look into things like padded short liners, also called chamois and chamois cream because there are options out there if you're not comfortable once you've looked at your saddle and other things like that. The next video is all about making sure that you're aware of what riding skills that you might want to be practicing because a capable bike still needs the rider and we want to be safe and the best team member we can be for our dogs. So we'll see you on the next video.